fails me all my days I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head oh, I will sing of the goodness of God God, that we can never use up all of your goodness, that it endures, it lasts forever to every generation. You always have been good and you always will be good. You're just perfect in all of your ways. Your decisions are always right. So we trust you, Lord. We trust your goodness. And Lord, even in those moments in our lives that we might not feel like we see your goodness, God, open our eyes. Help us, Lord, to see the goodness of the Lord shining in the midst of a dark situation, God. Open our eyes, Lord. Help us to see it, Father. Your word says that you work all things together for the good of those who love you, the ones who are called according to your purpose. And Lord, we want to live for your purpose, for your plans. God, let us be a people convinced of the goodness of God. We thank you, Lord. We rest in your goodness, God. We choose to rest knowing that you're good. Thank you, Lord.
Lord, you're the one that we want. God, forgive us for those times that we've chased after other things, God. May you be the one that we pursue. May you be the one that we run after, that we chase hard after. May you be the one that we follow. May our confession always be that you are the one. We just want you. We don't want anything else. You're the one that we want, Jesus. You and you alone. Not the praise of men. Not success in the world's eyes. You're the one that we want. You are the one that we want to please. Your purposes are the ones that we want to accomplish. You and you alone. You're all that matters. You're all that matters. And God, forgive me for those times when I've lived as if other things mattered. When I focused on other things and took my eyes off of my pursuit of you.
began to breathe and out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave as no claim on me cause Jesus is yours is the victory yeah. hallelujah praise the one who set me free hallelujah death has lost its grip on me cause you have broken every chain there's salvation in your name Jesus Christ my living hope hallelujah hallelujah praise the one who set me free hallelujah death has lost its grip on me cause you have broken every chain there's salvation in your name Jesus Christ my living hope Jesus Christ my living hope Jesus Christ my living hope oh we thank you Lord for the hope that we have in you because of your empty tomb because of the cross of Christ God why so downcast oh my soul put your hope in God Father we put our hope in you Jesus Lord we thank you that you are the hope of the hopeless that you are the one who brings joy to the morning and that you give light to the ones who are stumbling in darkness God that you are the solution to every problem we just worship you thank you for breaking the hold that death had on us that we don't have to live under those chains but that you made us free that where the spirit of the Lord is there is liberty and Lord we thank you that we have your spirit in our hearts and you've made us free Jesus we worship you Lord we worship you thank you for our broken chains thank you for our broken chains if you have a Bible you can open up to Genesis we're going to begin there today and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be, if you, if you want to try for scriptures, I'm going to be in um, the NIV, in Genesis chapter 1, starting. Um, Steve and Sally, they, uh, but um, they were unable to come. And the reason, if, I don't know, how many of you know Steve and Sally Wilson? How many of you have seen them before or know who they are? Well, they were, they were part of the, our original um, uh, kind of board of outside directors for the church when we planted River Center Church. We've known them a long, long time. And they still, we still get to see them every year or two and they come up just to bless us and minister and we stay in contact. And Steve's someone I can call if, I, if I'm having some kind of a crisis. That doesn't hardly ever happen, but we stay, we stay in touch here and there. And um, wonderful people. Anyhow, uh, Sally uh, was just diagnosed with cancer. And so they have to begin treatment this week. That just happened. And so let's pray for them together. And so they, they had a trip planned up here and to James River Church, so they had to postpone that trip. But let's pray for Steve and Sally right now. Lord God, we just lift them up before you, Jesus. I just thank you for this couple, for their powerful ministry. They minister all over the world. They've uh, been senior leaders and now kind of retired at, at, um, in Springfield, Missouri, at Day Spring Church. And uh, Lord, I just pray for your covering over them, God, right now. I just pray that you just bless and lead them and we pray for complete healing in Sally. And uh, I know their, their spirits are high, their focus is on you, and they're not afraid. I just praise you for that, Jesus Christ. But we are agreeing with them now for complete healing, for blessing, and that you continue to let them uh, just be such a bright light during this time to all those around them and to your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you for praying with me for them. So um, we're going to be spending some time talking about marriage in the upcoming weeks, some of the weeks. And um, 
just a little series. And today, we're just going to start in Genesis and looking at a foundation of marriage. And I spent quite a bit of time praying about this week, this about, about this this week. And Steve, Steve was planning on preaching, but I knew earlier in the week he wasn't going to be here. So I got to spend a lot of time. And um, this is just kind of what I feel like God wants us to focus on today. It's not only a foundation for marriage, it's a foundation for really every part of our theology as a Christian. That's our thinking about God, our thinking about ourselves. We're not going to read all of the beginning of Genesis today, but as we do, you're going to see uh, some things that will apply to you, whether you're married or not right now, whether you ever will be or have been, because who we are, who we are created to be, changes the way we look at the whole world. Amen? If we really think that we are in just uh, an accident, which is what a pure evolutionary idea about uh, nature is, uh, not even you're not even the best of nature, you're just what happened to happen by random chance that was able to survive. If that's who you really believe you are, then it really changes the way you think about yourself and other people. Uh, humans aren't worth that much more than a dog. Of course, I had my grand puppy with me this week, and my Levi was like, I jump out in front of a bus for that puppy. And, you know, <laughs> he's going to be a veterinarian, but we all love him to pieces. So but the point isn't that God, God knows the number of sparrows and how many feathers they have. So God knows these things and cares. But the point is, if we are only that, then, then our loss isn't much more than a cow that we eat or anything else. But God's perspective, God's perspective about human beings is very different. We have a purpose, amen, and we are divine in part of our nature. And through Jesus Christ, we are redeemed to come into the presence of God and return to our place before God where we were created to be as human beings, as his children, amen. All right, let's just begin with verse 24 of chapter one of Genesis. If you've got a Bible, we're just gonna be in Genesis today, I believe. And we get, to, we get to read through creation, beginning in chapter one. I'll just read verse one. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and the earth was formless and empty and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And I love, this is totally a rabbit trail I think, but I love this week, I was reading uh, Proverbs eight and nine and six and seven. And uh, the spirit is there, the spirit of wisdom, saying how the spirit of wisdom was there with God right here at this moment, at the very beginning of creation, delighting in everything he was doing. It's a beautiful picture. And then delighting in the creation of human beings. I won't turn there, but Proverbs six through nine, you get wisdom, folly, and that whole focus and uh, delighting in the creation of human beings, the wisdom of God. Praise God. Verse 24, God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds. The livestock, the creatures that move along the ground, and the wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so, God made the wild animals according to their kinds, and a kind there is like, we're talking about a, you know, like a phylum, like a, you know, we're talking a type of animal, a family, a group of animals. You know, the canines and whatever. Each according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. So just notice here what God's doing. He says, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds. It says God made all these, the wild animals and the livestock according to their kinds. So we have something going on there. God is doing something. The land, there's, there's something going on. There's God directly creating and God's using his creation to continue the creation. This is all to God's glory. And God said, let us make mankind in our image, verse 26, in our likeness, so they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So we see human beings, uh, the direct, on-purpose creation of God, 
with a specific purpose on this planet, which is to, to be those who care for and ru rule over, is just talking about like your garden. If you rule over your garden well, it's going to produce some fruit. There's going to be rows of things. You're going to be plucking out the weeds. That's the picture that's here. It's, of course, not talking about just trashing everything, right? That, that's silly. But that is our place in creation over all those creatures that we would rule them. Verse 27, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth and subdue it. And rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it, they will be yours for food. And to all the wild beasts of the earth and all the birds of the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw that what he had made and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. All right, let's go into chapter two. We get to see kind of a, a, a zoom in picture of the creation of human beings. We've seen here kind of an overview of the creation of everything. Um, now we get to see a little closer view. Let's look at verse 15, chapter two. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky, and he brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And before we go any farther, I just want, it, it is amazing to me uh, that as we have learned more about nature, about biology, that the word of God remains so accurate and true to what we have learned. Right here it's saying that the, all, these, all the creatures here on earth are made up out of the, the minerals and the things we find in the soil. And this is true. Every strand of our DNA, it's all, it all comes down to simple little pieces that you'd find there in the dirt. Everything we are, isn't that amazing? So on and on and on, we could go through Genesis, spend many weeks talking just about these chapters. And, but think about God wanting to communicate this to us as human beings. He had to communicate in a way that would be understood by people a thousand years ago, 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, 1,000 years in the future, we're all here. He had to, so, so what he's doing here as we read through it is he's communicating uh, in a way that can be understood by all those people because his point, of course, isn't just science. His point is understanding our place in God's universe and his garden and what he's done. Isn't he amazing? Amen. So here we see him forming out of, out of the elements of the earth, all these creatures. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock and the birds of the sky and all the wild animals. And for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. A lot of study has been done on that word helper, and uh, there's no reason to make too much into it. Actually, we've gone through like already like 35 things that we could spend a whole sermon on, to all the ideas people have had about different words and things, because these chapters are so fundamental. But definitely the, the idea of helper there is it's a, it's a completer, one who completes him or one who uh, enables him to, to do what he's called to do. It's definitely not a servant. That idea is, this word is not used for that word. It's not, it's not a servant for him. It's someone to help complete him so that his mission, the mission of humankind can be completed. A beautiful thing. Like the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness, right? He brought them, 
uh, to the man. So the man gave them names. Adam had no suitable helper. Verse 21. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. And the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man. And he brought her to the man. All right, so this is the only time we have a record of any kind of creation happening like this by God. And when I read these about God, and especially in light of modern science, it's like, I, for, for me and my limited understanding, it's just like God is doing genetic engineering here at a high level. I mean, the, the, the people who think aliens brought life to earth, I mean, this, this is kind of their thing. And uh, as you read through the biblical era literature, extra biblical stuff, like Enoch, um, Enoch tells us that uh, the fallen angels were actually doing genetic manipulation of animals and creating animals that were not the way God created them. And some people think the flood, part of the flood was to wipe out those kind of abominations. Every sci-fi movie you ever saw is going through your mind right now. We weren't there, so our imaginations definitely can take us who knows where. But I want you to think about this. Sometimes when we read these words or when you think about God creating things, you can think of it as just a fantasy somewhere or just some kind of like, oh, just some children's story. You know, like, like Noah and, Noah and Noah's Ark was just this, you know, you see a little rainbow and some little kid's story with, you know, and Rex and I just today were talking about pot, the possibility of going down to the Ark Museum again, which we did some time ago. I'd love that. How many of you would like to go on a trip down there? We took a church, church trip down there. That's pretty fun. It's just a, maybe more than a day's drive. It's a two-day drive, I think. I can't remember how long we took. Depends how long you drive. We Did we make it a day? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> What'd you say? It? It's, it's uh, right on the... Uh, north side of Kentucky. Yeah, just, just north side of Kentucky, south of Cincinnati. Um, Cincinnati's not in Kentucky, but just that's... I remember going through Cincinnati. Anyhow, so... Uh, if I got that wrong, I'm not a geography major. So <laughs> it was a great time. Anyhow, so, so you get to see the whole arc, and it was an amazing thing. Definitely not just a children's story. But we read these things, especially the ancient writings here um, of the beginning of Genesis, and it's easy to think of it just as like, just like silly stories, things that don't apply to us today. It's easy to think this way. But you've got to understand God is the, great, the creator. He is the great scientist, He's the one that at a fundamental level created the forces that allow our universe to stick together at this moment, right? These ones that if just one of them changed literally all the matter would just fly apart in the whole universe. He's the one who created these things. And when he's created human beings, he does something a little different here with his creation. However, he did it exactly. But at the DNA level, he's taking the rib of an actual human being to create another human being instead of straight out of the dust. The man said, verse 23, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. Only time in creation something like this happened. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they, became, they become one flesh. All right, this is as far as we're going to go in here today. Do we, thank you so much for getting these up here. I'm going to read it again, beginning verse 23. And the man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. And that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. I'm just going to read it again. I just want to sink in. This is the foundation of marriage. This is the importance God places on it. This is the place that marriage has in the human experience under God's design. This is before sin. This is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh, 
She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. So the very creation of a woman and a man is a matter of two parts of the same, now being two different beings that now come together, uh, placing the priority on that marriage above all other priorities, and now come back together into one. They who are separated now become one again. They become one flesh. That flesh is just it's talking about body. So it's out of my body. Something was taken and something beautiful and amazing was created. And now we've come together. And now what you have a picture here is a picture of completion. We were, part of me was separated so that all that was needed could be created. And now unity and wholeness has come again. Isn't that a beautiful picture of marriage? And notice the priority that that God is putting on it here from the very beginning. And remember, this is before any laws about marriage are written, okay? This is before any traditions have been established. This is before any of that. There are only two people present. And this is God's commentary on what has happened here. This is why a man leaves his father and mother. In other words, this becomes the, the, the most important part of their life. This now is the most important part of their life, this marriage. And they're united together and they become one flesh. Jesus, when he's talking about this, he says, he says what God has put together, let no one separate. How many of you have read that in the New Testament? Have you heard, remember Jesus is talking about? And they're asking him about divorce, the religious leaders, because uh, people have always had trouble getting along as long as they've been people who are sinful, <laughs> okay? So I don't know when the first divorce was, but I imagine it was pretty darn early in the, you know, in the history of humankind. So in Jesus' day, of course, there was all through history that we know, there have been people who just could not get along, even irreconcilable differences for one reason or another. And uh, so in Jesus' day, they came to him and asked him, what about this? You know, what's going on here? And then some people at one point tried to kind of trap him into if somebody's been married several times, you know, who are they with in eternity? You know, you know they, they, all these questions having to do with marriage, divorce. And Jesus' answer is clear there. He says, well, sometimes you have to make a concession. You know, Moses made concessions because of the difficulty of human beings, the hardness of our hearts, that he made a way for us to not have to kill each other to separate, <laughs> divorce. He made a way, but this is not God's intention from the beginning. His intention was this right here, because what God has put together, we don't want anyone to have to separate again, because that missing part of us that is made complete in marriage, we don't want anything to have to rip that apart. Amen. You ever, see, you ever seen a movie where somebody like, you know, just like, grabs somebody's heart and rips it out of them or something like that, you know? You, Indiana Jones had one of those. <laughs> that's the picture that's happening here. That's in God's sight, in God's mind, that's the picture of what's happening when a marriage falls apart and breaks apart and divorce happens. The picture is just part of you, that rib that was taken away and God did something beautiful with it. He did his, he did his scientific stuff, his genetic stuff and now there's a woman and a man and when they come back together and now they're one flesh again and wholeness has come, to separate that again is, is a ripping apart of the heart, of the flesh. I just want to pray for you if you've gone through that in this place. And Sarah and I, we've been talking about that, this this week. We were talking about someone... Um, we knew that had to go through divorce and didn't want to. And man, I just want to pray for you right now. And, but you need to remember that like so many of the other hurts that we experience in our heart, this is not God's intention from the beginning. This is the result of sin, right? This is the result of people who are selfish or don't understand or, or not following God. That is where divorce comes from, right? The, the things that lead up to it, the reconcilable differences or the, the inability to be faithful to another spouse or whatever it is that brought about that. 
I just want to pray for you. Right now, God, for each person who's experienced this, God, who's in this room or listening to this, God, comfort their heart and help them right now. God, when a part of ourselves has been ripped out, God, even if we knew it was the right thing or even if there was nothing we could do about it or even if it was long ago in the past, God, I am just praying that you will right now do the miracle needed to fill in that place, to fill in that place, God, with your love, with your help, with your grace. Lord, this sin is so terrible, so painful, and the results that come from it, Lord, in our world, our fallen world. But God, I am praying that you will come in right now, and right now, as we talk about foundations in marriage, God, that you will come in and just heal that heart. God, heal that place, that place in the flesh, that place in the spirit where there's wounding, where something's been ripped apart. I pray you'll come in and heal that right now, Jesus Christ, that you will bring complete restoration, that what Satan meant for evil and the pain that was gone through, God, that you will turn it now for good, that you will turn it now through healing, through your presence, through your leadership, into something which brings life, into a place where there was, there's a scar left that, that's a healing that you have brought, God. Thank you, Jesus. God, just send that right now. In Jesus' name, I pray. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Receive that. So we see here, I'm going to read it again, 23 and 24. I, I want you to remember it. The man said, this is now, it's bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. And she'll be called woman, for she was taken out of a man. And that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. So notice that the completion that's brought about by the creation of the woman, it doesn't lead the man to look at her as like a second-class human being of some kind. There's nothing like that happening. In fact, it, the fact that, that the woman and the man complete each other actually leads the man, in this case, but the man and the woman, it leads them to value the other more highly than any other thing in their life. Do you hear that? There have been lots of people who have used the scriptures as an excuse for treating people badly. Or, in, you know, in, in our day, this is a, commonly brought up, and rightly so sometimes, that the, the, in the past, uh, women were uh, treated badly by the patriarchy and put down in their place, and men held them down. And that happened in the past sometimes. And sometimes, of course, like anything else, you can carry it over to man-hating in our day. That's not what God wants, right? He doesn't want women hating men, but he doesn't want anyone being treated badly. Look at, how, look at his example here. Look at his example here that because you're now meeting with the one who completes you, they must now be the most precious thing in your life, the most valuable thing in your life, the one that's actually worth putting number one when it comes to the priorities here on earth among human beings. That's beautiful, isn't it? That's God's instruction from the beginning. Amen. Now, of course, it's lived out differently in different cultures, in different times. Even today around the world, there, you know, as I've got to travel a lot, I do mission work and different things, there are some places where, you know, I've heard people say, I would not want my daughter marrying one of these guys, <laughs> okay? And it's only because, it's not because of bad people, it's only because of the cultural thing of, you know, uh, woman keep quiet, walk 10 paces behind man kind of a thing. You know, to us, that's kind of like, eh. <laughs> okay? But around the world, some cultures are still that way. And in all of that, this, what God has spoken here must fit into every culture. Though. That's the point. Now, in our day, sometimes we think of marriage so lightly that we just throw it away. I had a wonderful time uh, with a couple of people at my house recently. We had a good talk about marriage and stuff. It was great. And it's one of the things that that God keeps bringing up and keeps bringing up back to me is the precious value of marriage in God's sight. And while we would look at a culture that, that 
makes women, women be in some different place than men, we would look at that as very antiquated or sometimes we look at that as immoral in different ways. You know, from God's perspective, a culture that looks at marriage as such a light thing that you might just throw it away because you just don't like the person or because you're attracted to some other person or, or because they no longer make you happy and you're running after happiness and so you just sign some documents from a lawyer and throw that marriage away. In God's sight, that's about the worst thing we could possibly do as a culture. You know that. Somebody say amen. So that means we need to be humble as Americans. When we look at either people of the past who lived out marriage differently or people today in different cultures, we need to be humble. In fact, we need to just say, God, help us, amen. Help us, God, help us. We are the ones in need of help. God, we are the ones who are backward, thinking that marriage is just for convenience. That's backward, amen. Thinking that I can just be united to my spouse and then be ununited and I'm not going to suffer in my heart for that. That is backward. Amen. God, let us not be so. But you know what your destiny is as a child of God, as a follower of Jesus Christ? Part of our job is to display for the whole world the glory of Jesus Christ by doing things his way. Amen so that your marriage can be a light to the whole world. In a world where people are nervous to get married because you know, their parents went through divorce or because they've gone through divorce before. But in a world where some, many people just say it's not worth it, what's the point, it's just a piece of paper, you know, these kinds of things. I, many, many people tell me these things. We hear them all the time. In that world, our mission as believers in Jesus Christ is to display the truth of God, what marriage is really about, and we do that by understanding the foundation of why it's here and who we are as human beings. As human beings, we are people that are made with a hole in our heart that only God can fill, amen. The very first thing we see here is that God and a human being are connecting together. And they're working together and they're living together and God is with that human being. That is our first priority. But the second that we see here is a marriage is two people that are brought together by God becoming one flesh. How many of you have heard in the Bible the description of the church as the bride of Christ? Okay, that's, that's language we get in the New Testament several times. In the Old Testament, we get language about Israel being the bride of God. God is the husband and Israel, his people, is the bride. That's where the bride of Christ language comes from, really in the New Testament too, but, and so the idea is there that is that God is a faithful husband who loves Israel, his wife, so much that even when she's unfaithful, he still seeks to take her back and to help her out. And we've got books in the Old Testament, even, you know, one prophet was called to marry a prostitute, even though he knew she would be unfaithful. But for him, this was like a prophetic thing, a picture of God and his people Israel, that God was still going to love them. God was still going to go after them, still going to bring them back, even though they were unfaithful. That's powerful, amen? amen. But you know what? I want you to get this. Marriage is not a reflection of the picture of God and the church, or God and Israel. The church and God is a picture of marriage. Marriage was first. The idea that Israel is the bride or the wife of God is a reflection of a truth that was here already and first, that there are two that are to become one flesh. What are you saying, Dallas? What I'm saying is that the most fundamental foundation when it comes to human interaction the one which so many others spring forth from, the pictures we get of Christ and the church. All of these come from marriage. Marriage does not come from these. Marriage is the foundational interaction of human beings that God created from the very beginning. Amen. Amen. So literally, my marriage is supposed to be a picture it's supposed to be a demonstration to people of how Christ will now love the church. Christ will love the church as much as I love my spouse. 
It's not supposed to be, I'll love my spouse as much as Christ loved the church. Marriage is so foundational, it is to be the first thing. Don't take this too far. Obviously, we are imperfect in our love and Christ is perfect. That's not the point. The point is the most foundational thing. Number one was a connection between a human being and God. That's Adam and Eve. And number two, a connection between two people that will never be separated. Flesh that was separated that is brought back together. Now, made complete. And from this foundation, all of human interaction, all of societal interaction, the the laws which God laid down for Israel, um, the way we're to relate to each other, uh, it, it is all reflective of this central thing that two people are to come together and become one flesh before God. That's powerful. Now, how many of you in this room have not looked at marriage that way? Sometimes we think marriage is just like, you know, hey, I want to be with this person. I like the way I feel around them. I want to sleep with them, whatever it is. And so things seem to be going well, so we're going to get married. And that, in all honesty, because we're human beings, that is the way a lot of us end up getting married. (laughs) Okay? (laughs) Because we really like this person. Uh, I really liked my wife. I, I must admit, it was not only for theological reasons that I married my wife. <laughs> I didn't want to be apart from her. My, uh, my eyes were locked on her. If I hadn't known anything about this, I still would have been with her. But what this now gives me, this understanding of God, a maturing and understanding in God, and now allows me to take my marriage seriously in a way that I wouldn't have when I was just following my feelings. And it wasn't just my feelings. I married a Christian girl on purpose. I mean, you know, I was trying to honor God, but I didn't marry an ugly Christian girl on purpose, you know? (laughs) Just confessing. But as I grow closer to God and understand him more, now my understanding of marriage is even expanded. That, wow, this is not just, you know, a natural response, a guy and a girl's eyes meet. You know, it's not that. It's something much, 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 much more. The very foundation of God's plan for human beings being all they are supposed to be. Now I get to participate in that, and Sarah and I together get to be a demonstration of that to the whole world. Wow, that if we had to let everything else go in our lives, just our walk with God, as you see with Adam, and then our commitment to each other, would be the, if they had to be the only two things that remained, we would be fulfilling the call of God. We could be fulfilling the call of God in our lives. You know what? When I know that, it means I'm a lot more willing to overlook little things that I don't like about my spouse or things that start to get on my nerves. When, when, I, when I understand this is what's going on, that there's a, there's, a, there's a completion now that has happened in me and that God wants the whole world to see, that this is foundational for everything that God has planned for me. When I see that and, and I'm feeling angry inside, my ire is up for some reason, it is much easier for me to say, God, wow, you know, this is really insignificant compared to, the blessing you have given me in marriage. And God, probably it's my own fault that I'm upset. It's probably really me I'm upset at. (laughs) And you're working it out. Thank you, God. God, I'm never letting this go. God, I don't care what I see. I don't care what happens. I am never letting this go. You have said this is literally the most important thing in your life now. I've given you a spouse. I've given you a place for the flesh. It is the most important thing. God, I'm never letting this go. And so Sarah and I, we had a rule, we've had a rule for a long time. We don't, we don't use the word uh, divorce or the idea that we're leaving each other. We don't even use it no matter how upset we are at each other. And we don't get upset at each other anymore, but it took some years to get to that place, you know that. And so um, we did, but we had that rule since we were young because we just, we were not going to do it. We were not going to get divorced no matter what. We were not going to leave each other no matter what. And uh, it was till death to us part. If I stepped out on her, I knew it would be death. 
So. <laughs> it's amazing what you can do when you know your life's on the line. <laughs> Not really. But so knowing that, we don't use that word, so we had to practice. We, don't, we just don't use that kind of language, even when we're upset at each other. We don't use that kind of language because for us, it is not an option. Amen, it's not an option. And this is why it's not an option. Now the two have become one, one flesh. How can you separate? But God's, what, remember what Jesus said, what God has put together, let no one separate. If you're married in this place right now, you may or may not feel like God put you together, okay? but God put you together. If you have married that person, you have been put together by God. So man, fight for it. Fight for it. Fight for this to be the reality in your life. What that makes us do is it makes us improve ourselves and it makes us be patient with our spouse to give them time to improve because you know, I got a lifetime here. We might as well get this right. That's a powerful force, amen, in a human being. That's a powerful force. That's the kind of powerful force that most of our grandparents experienced or whatever. Some of them turned out bitter. <laughs> Some of them turned out better. <laughs> I, want, I want the better side. Amen. If you're in this place and you're married or you're hoping to be married someday, I just want to pray for you right now. Maybe, maybe you'd be even more theologically astute than I was when I fell in love with Sarah. But either way, I'm praying that this will be a reality for you. Married now are going to be married soon. This will be reality to you that I'm not just doing something because it feels good for me or because I like to be with the person and I don't want to be lonely. God, literally, I'm, you're allowing me, God, to have a place in my flesh covered now. And this is a lifetime thing. And it's, and it's a beautiful thing. And along with connecting with you, God, this is the calling. My calling is a human being. So I pray for you right now. Jesus Christ, I just pray for each person in this room married right now, or looking to be married. And oh God, I just pray that you would just build, God, an excitement in them to fulfill their calling, just like ruling over the fish and the birds and the animals. In other words, doing a good job managing the part of the earth you've given us and taking our place as those that, that can that can do conservation, all kinds of things, God. You, you gave us the mind to be able to do these things, God, and said, do I do it? And that God, just like that, you have given us both a need for someone else and the ability to then now become one flesh again, whole and complete. And Father, it is beautiful in your eyes. And God, we just commit right now in Jesus' name to value this to value this as the most important thing in our lives next only to our connection with you, God, ourselves. Thank you, Lord. God, it's more important than a job. God, it's more important than a, than a friend who's, who's being a negative influence. God, it's more important than a hobby or something we want to do. God, it, it is, this is the priority in our life is valuing, nurturing, this two become one and walking with you, God, in our garden. God, these are the priorities of our life. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, God. I just thank you and I pray for a blessing over every marriage in this, those listening and those here right now. God, I pray a blessing over every marriage that God, that it would be joy, that every day, God, just the walking with you and the walking with that spouse would be the joys of life God, I pray for strength in that, Lord. I pray, Lord God, that Satan would not be able to come in with ideas, oh, this is too hard, or it's not worth it, or maybe you don't really belong with this person. We just reject all of those ideas in Jesus' name. We recognize that our foundation in creation is on knowing you, God, and on two becoming one now that cannot be separated. Thank you, Lord. This is who you called us to be. This is the beauty of who you made us in creation. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. We just praise you. I just pray that blessing now over each home. Bless each marriage. God, just with joy. God, just with joy and thankfulness, gratefulness, God, for the place in the flesh that's been healed now. Thank you, God. Bless each one in Jesus' name. 
And if you're in this place and you're a Christian married to someone who's not a Christian, I'm just gonna pray for you right now. God, I just pray for every Christian in this place. And God, we've got some instructions in the New Testament, and, but, and the goal is to bring them to Jesus Christ. And God, I just pray your blessing over each one whose spouse is, is hurting spiritually or doesn't know you at all. God, I just pray you bless them with grace from heaven, with faith from heaven, to believe that their one that they love, that they are united with now, will come to know you, will come to love you, and that their marriage will continue to grow and be better and better, Lord God, as they come under your leadership. God, bless them with faith and strength. Encourage them. And I thank you, Lord, that you are with them each moment and you are pleased with them as they love and honor their spouse. As they, as they care about their marriage. God, bless them, strengthen them, Jesus, and give them joy in that, I pray, great joy. Thank you. Thank you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.